Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today I want to talk about the first picture of another planet taken by a spacecraft. In the mid-1960s, the Apollo program was in full swing, but JPL were sending probes to other planets. They had previously sent Mariner 1 and 2 to Venus, except Mariner 1 had failed. So Mariner 2 became the first space probe to successfully fly by another planet. But these first Mariner spacecraft didn't carry imaging systems. What they did carry was microwave and infrared radiometers where they could scan across the surface of Venus and they could actually use it to peek below the clouds and measure the temperature of the surface and confirm what ground-based observations had suggested that Venus was a really hot place. Mariner 1 and 2 had originally been called Mariner R because they'd basically taken the Ranger spacecraft and adjusted it a little for flight in deep space, giving it a bigger antenna. Now for the next step to go out to Mars, that was going to be further from the Sun, it was going to be in a colder environment with less solar power further from Earth. And so JPL really went to work to iterate on their design and make a true deep space spacecraft. And so Mariner 3 and 4 were designed to go into deep space and also carry a camera with them to image the surface of Mars. Now earlier in 1964, Ranger 7 had provided some of the first close-up images of the moon and it had been able to send back real-time television imagery. But that was over a much shorter distance. At the distance of Mars, the amount of data they would be able to squeeze into the radio beam wouldn't be enough to provide anything like the bandwidth they needed. Therefore, they had to come up with a radical new way of sending the imagery back. They came up with a digital camera. The imaging technology of the day used Vidicon tubes. That's where you would focus the light onto a special sensitive plate and you would form little uh, pockets of electrical charge which were you had more charge in them when there was more light and then you could read that out using an electron beam coupled to an amplifier. These tubes could be designed so that the image would persist and could be read out over several seconds. But there was a limit to this, like the longer they took to read out the lit image, the more the image would degrade due to like natural charge leakage or radiation from space. At the distance of Mars, it would take about eight hours to send back a single image and by then the image on the tube would have completely degraded. Now, the Soviet Union had used a different tactic during their imaging of the far side of the moon on Luna 3. They had used regular photographic film, although albeit some very special photographic film, and uh, they had developed it on board the spacecraft and then scanned that back slowly and played it down to Earth. But for Mariner, the plan was instead to read the image off the, the tubes and store it on tape, which could then be played back at a later time. Now, they could have just stored an analog image onto these tapes and then sent that back. But the problem is that when you're sending, again, these signals over such long distances, you, you get noise leaking in. Whereas if they store it in digital format, they would be able to exactly replicate the image on both ends. So the imaging system would scan out the image 200 lines of 200 pixels each with a depth of 6 bits. That means it's about 30 kilobytes of data. And since this was the early days of digital photography, they weren't bound by our conventions that says big numbers mean bright. No, they did it backwards. The number 63 meant it was black. Number 0 meant that it was full white. There were, of course, a number of other scientific instruments for the encounter with Mars. There was a, a magnetometer, dust detector, cosmic ray telescope, radiation detectors, and a plasma probe and ionization chamber. All this was powered by a set of four solar panels, which uh, generated something like 300 watts of power. The spacecraft had some automation capabilities with an onboard sequencer that could basically execute commands at a specific time and could be reprogrammed in flight to change the execution plan. For course corrections, the spacecraft had a monopropellant hydrazine thruster that generated about 20 kilograms of thrust, and for attitude control, it had a set of 12 
uh, cold gas nitrogen thrusters. Now, to actually sense its attitude and you know, remain stable, it was one of the first spacecraft to include a Canopus star tracker, basically track the star Canopus, which is one of the, it's the second brightest star in the sky, but unlike Sirius, it is far away from the ecliptic, so it's never going to find itself too close to the sun to be trackable. And that actually makes it one of the most important stars for celestial navigation of spacecraft. And as it happens, Frank Herbert stated that the planet Arrakis orbits Canopus, making the star even more important for celestial navigation in the Dune universe. The launch vehicle for Mariner 3 and 4 would be the Atlas Agena, and they needed to develop a new fairing to contain it. This was a lightweight fiberglass fairing, and the launch of Mariner 3 proved that this bit the fairing was just a little bit too lightweight. After it got to space, it was unable to deploy its solar panels, and they eventually figured out that the fairing had crushed under uh, you know aerodynamic forces and hadn't separated. So the engineering team quickly got to work developing a new all-metal fairing and had it constructed, built, and on the rocket in, re in time for Mariner 4 to depart for Mars still within the same launch window. So at the time of the launch, all the imagery that existed of Mars was basically from ground-based telescopes, and that's very hard to get good imagery with the technology of the era. Uh, Giovanni Schiaparelli, of course, in 1877, he went and did his own sketches of Mars and began talking about channels, which somehow got translated into canals. And of course, that was one of the things that led into the idea of life on Mars and Martian civilizations. And while the idea of the canals disappeared by the 60s, uh, there were still lots of maps, and yeah, the imagery wasn't great, but it did appear to show changes happening on the surface of Mars, so there were people who thought that there was a good chance of finding life. This was a, an official US government map of Mars at the time, like in the 1960s, they were still showing these straight features, because they couldn't see otherwise. Some people would see them, others wouldn't. The fact that the atmosphere was so incredibly turbulent meant that people would see all sorts of things as the, you know, the light from the planet shifted in the eyes of the beholder. And it meant that when they were planning this, they actually used one of these maps that was hand sort of sketched with these linear features. So this is a plan of the observing campaign for the camera. And you can see right at the very top, image number one, as it was sliding across. And you would see the images came in pairs. So they would take one image through like a red filter and the next one through a green filter. And there'd be a small area that would overlap between these. It would take about a minute to dump each of these images out and store them on the tape. So this whole you know, image sequence covers like you know 20 minutes during close approach and that was it. They had to make sure they got this right. So there was no downlink during this uh, encounter. So soon after the encounter is complete, they start replaying the data and as it comes down, they basically they're printing it out onto these teletypes. So the 500 basically tells you that it's a, a line in an image, right? So, and the, the second value is actually what the pixel value is there. Remember, these numbers are backwards, so zero means it's white, and the higher the number gets, the darker the imagery is. So when they start looking at the first image coming down, it's the first row is all 63. That means black, which is kind of logical because you're shooting space. Now, they expected the first few rows to be black, but they are sitting watching this teletype and the numbers start to change and they start to realize they are seeing the planet Mars. So they know there's data in there and it will eventually get sent down to the computer imaging people and they will convert it to images. But they want to make sure their camera is working. So what do they do? They start cutting up these strips and figuring out if they can make an image using the strips. They start pasting these to the board in vertical strips matching up to the pixels. And they need to come up with a way to actually discern between the dark areas and the light. So uh, one of the guys goes to an art store and he asks for chalk. But they are there, of course, they don't have chalk, but they have this nice pastel set. And uh, yeah, they, they look and they find like something where they have four different shades and it turns out that red is the color they're using 
Uh, basically, they're filling in the, the things by reading off the numbers and, you know, right doing it by hand. And so this historic first image of another planet is rendered into being by engineers one pixel at a time by hand. It wasn't an amazing faithful rendition. Uh, it was the wrong aspect ratio. It didn't have really the, you know, level of grayscales, but it was the first. The data was, of course, sent down to the computer labs and they ended up printing out the images which would actually be released first. In total, Mariner captured 22 frames, although the last three were in darkness and, in fact, the last frame was missing a lot of lines. But, of course, science was done. Here's uh, and where they basically adjust the contrast and they could see haze and clouds in the edge on the limb of Mars. But I think the really important thing that the Mariner images showed was that as they started to go across the planet, they began to see some terrain and then they began to see circular features. And as they got to the ideal illumination angles, it becomes clear that those circular creature uh, features are actually impact craters. And that basically changed the way people had thought about Mars. The, for a long time, they thought it had a much thicker atmosphere, but seeing these impact craters basically told them that uh, Mars was pretty much a dead world. Not just that the atmosphere was thin enough that craters happened at a much higher rate on Earth, but that the uh, atmosphere was not sufficient to weather these craters down and remove them like we do on, see on Earth. The Mariner 4 images weren't of sufficient fidelity to start showing the features that suggested that Mars might have been wet in the past. That would, of course, fall to future missions such as Viking. The next mission that would go to Mars would be uh, Mariner 6, and it was uh, significantly heavier. By that point, they had managed to solve the problems with the Centaur, and so they could loft a much heavier spacecraft on its way to Mars. And while these images would be a step up and significantly better, they kind of lack the charm of a room full of engineers painting by numbers delivered by a spacecraft 100 million miles away. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.